Hi, welcome to the second installment of a grand 15 year long <laughs> science fiction masterworks group discussion series. Uh, today we are reading the second book of the science fiction masterworks. We're reading them in the order they were published as masterworks. So today we're reading I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, which I have somewhere over here. Yeah. Um, and with me, I have some wonderful people. Uh, Susanna, would you like to start us off with introductions? Hello, uh, my name is Susanna Imaginario. I write uh, fantasy and I recently started a YouTube channel where I rant about things. <laughs> Cool. My name is Chris Mullen. I also have a YouTube channel, which I sometimes post about movies or books and occasionally appear on other people's channels and talk uh, about things that we generally love. Mm. <laughs> um, I'm Jared. I uh, run the Fantasy Thinker booktube channel and uh, do some blog stuff on page chewing and um, like to talk about this stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Robin from Bookends and Biscuits. Uh, I have a YouTube channel where I mostly talk about sci-fi, so this series is great for me. I'm very happy to be discussing it. And I'm Leila Goshi. I um, am a writer, poet. Um, I have a website and YouTube channel called Bellady Magazine. Nice. And I realized I forget, as usual, to introduce myself because this goes up on other people's channels as well. Uh, my name is Varsha and Reading by the Rainy Mountain is my YouTube channel. So this book I did not expect to like because it's a vampire story and a zombie story <laughs> wrapped into one. Uh, but yet it really worked for me. What did you all think? Uh, oh, yeah, loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, no, yeah, I was... Uh, uh, surprised because I watched the movie first, mm. um, one of the movies I watched, the one with <laughs> Will Smith, and I really liked it. And I was a bit disappointed at the beginning when I realized it wasn't the same thing. Mm. Um, and I, I kept reading just because it was short and I figured, well, I might as well continue. And then, uh, yeah, I'm glad that I did. And the ending really broke me. Yeah, it was one of the best endings. Mm -hmm. This is a reread for me, and it's only when I got to the end of it the second time. I was reading the afterward. I'm sure lots, lots of you have read it by Stephen King as well. Mm -hmm. When he acts like this is this is like one of these dumb things. I never really considered that it was a horror book, but it's very clearly a horror book. Mm -hmm. The kind of genre hadn't kind of filtered into me because it's about a lot of things aside from the horror. You know, the, 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 the important stuff and the bits that I really liked set outside. Maybe the thrill of the chase or, or him getting mm -hmm. hunted down. So, yeah, yeah. Every time my husband passed me by last night as I was reading it, he's like, what are you reading and why is your face constantly in that expression? Because I was, <laughs> 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 because I was so scared or sad or like <laughs> there was just like a lot going on in the books. <laughs> yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed this book because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I experienced a lot of zombie burnout, I guess, you know, <laughs> over my lifetime, because there's, there's a lot of zombie mm. themed uh, films. And, and I know these, these are called vampires in here, but they kind of do have a zombie type mm. presence. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was like a little wary going into it. And I was like, but as soon as the, the narrative started and the writing started, um, it, it really sucked me in and uh and i just love how it was all explained and and when you uh realize that it's kind of uh surreal that's taken place in the 70s mm. you know and it's written in 1954 but it was taking place in the future in the 70s and it's very it's kind of surreal how that plays out because it he doesn't really make too many predictions about the future and what it would have been like mainly do because the world's been basically destroyed <laughs> but um but uh i really i really liked how it, I, I actually liked how it wasn't done in first person it wasn't told like robin mm -hmm. wasn't telling the story it was done it was mm -hmm. done you know as his it was all robert's point of view but yeah narrated from uh 
you know, not in a, in a third person form. And uh, so that, that really endeared me to it. And I liked, I loved how, uh, and of course, all the themes he gets into in this book mm. uh, about, about solitariness and survival, you know, the desperation of the character and that need for that search and need for human contact and stuff mm. is really well done. Yeah. yeah. What I thought was interesting about that third person was that the author didn't refer to the character as Robert. It was always Neville, my last name, mm. which, you know, there's a bit more distance than you would if you have just the first person, right? Um, that was interesting. I was curious why he did that. Um, but I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> no, it gives I, it, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, I think it was exactly to to add that extra distance um, mm -hmm. in this case, because it's such a short story and it, it, I think it made it easier to empathize with the character from that distance than if it was himself narrating. So it's just mm -hmm. adding to that, yeah. I think. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, and it, it allows you to analyze it a little bit more too when you have that. Mm -hmm. That that formal distance there, Robert yeah. Neville, all the yeah. time, and yeah. uh, and it, it also it ties into Robert's need to find a scientific reason for the mm. vampires to exist. Yeah. And stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a key part of the story that you have to do it from a distance because a lot of the emotions that you were talking about when you were talking about your face going from sad, <laughs> etc are weird judgment calls to make given what the kind of final judgment of him as a person is mm. in, in the book and how we still feel affected by that and if right. we were doing it from a first person narrative we would think we were duped whereas mm. in this case we can kind of look at it and go we, we looked at his actions and we deserve decide whether mm. justified or not as yeah. we went through and therefore could feel empathy with him because mm. of all, all that went that way yeah yeah that that makes sense and there were also many uh lines or many statements that didn't seem entirely like we were in his head just observing him from a distance because there were things like he had if he had seen his expression he'd be surprised or something like that something to that effect so it wasn't just his point of view it wasn't it was observing him from a bit of distance so yeah that that's interesting i think robin or leila were about to say something sorry when i interrupted well what's on my mind i i'm not sure What's on my mind is I was thinking back, um, you know, uh, to 70s novels and sci-fi and um, and even the 50s. And they they do all have this same type of theme that I really liked of like this um, small, small town America. I mean, even like Carrie, you know, which is different, but, you know, kind of like this here's this small town and and this normal situation with this undercurrent of either horror or mystery or something um and um and i like the simplicity of it like the simple horror of it if i can if that makes sense and and i even would include like ray bradbury if anyone's read ray bradbury books but um like uh you know he tells them uh in the third person and they um have these weird circumstances in the midst of you know what uh is seemingly ordinary even when they're on mars i mean there's this whole book by ray bradbury bradbury called the martian chronicles and um mm -hmm. so anyway that's something i really liked about this book i felt like we were it was sort of that same theme and um, to even put kind of a cultural spin on it or something, you know, he had said it uh, like more of a in a 50 style neighborhood, but it being in the 70s after so much change happened, you know, in the 60s, I just feel, feel like there were these repeated um, uh, stories of, um, you know, like the world going crazy, you know, between mm -hmm right after World War II to the mid 70s. Um, and we're probably back in that situation now. But um, but yeah, so that was just something that stood out to me generally about this book that I really liked. And also that if you 
once you finish it, if you go back and read parts of it again, I started seeing things a little different, you know, like mm -hmm. was his friend, like we thought his friend was calling to him because he was out of his head and possessed, but maybe he was cognizant of all he was doing mm -hmm. and trying to get them to join him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think especially when he started looking for potentially curing the uh, disease, like at least that seemed to be his goal at the outset. Uh, I started to wonder if you know this would lead to some sort of moral dilemma in the character about all the people he's killed so far, who maybe could have been cured. They weren't like really dead, dead. So yeah, um, yeah I think there's a lot of interesting uh, fallout from his act actions, aspects that we could explore. Uh, he has a lot of guilt about his wife, right? And that, again, I think when you start to wonder how they died, uh, I, I found myself wondering if, you know, they had turned into zombies, his wife and daughter, and what role he had to play in their ultimate destruction, <laughs> right? Um, so that that is really difficult to live with, especially when you're living by yourself. Um, I thought there were some many not explicitly written about, but some deep and powerful aspects that made me think a lot about like what would be the psychological and emotional fallout from this. I, I, no, I was going to say I very much agree. I think you, when you first meet his character, he's so flawed. You, you don't really like him at all. I certainly didn't. But you kind mm -hmm. of, when you explore the background and how he got there, it's much more, you kind of, you like, come on this side almost, not really, but you kind of, it's much more understandable about where he's coming from and what he's been through and where he came to. But, um, mm -hmm. His scientific, scientific investigation annoyed me as a science person, but apart from that, it was, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll come on. That was one of my one of my notes to say the science and this how does how does it work how does it not work. I think just the original point though. I think a lot of the book is spent on showing the differences between Neville as a human and the others as subhuman, and that actually a bit what you're saying, Lila. When, when I went through the reread, I kind of went actually, but there's a lot of subtext in here about how they're exactly the same. You know, there is no yeah. difference actually between them, uh, and you know lots of things like he's afraid of the light when he gets up in the morning he's kind of blinded by the light and all of those kind mm. of things that go this the, just like the the uh, the vampires or whoever else is, is going along with it so it, it's kind of like that kind of battle all the time between you know what what he's telling us and what we see and what we judge as a reader and kind of what we take away from that yeah i thought that was great um the only part that that really uh got me was he seemed to not he didn't treat his daughter, in my opinion, as carefully as he did his wife. And I just wondered, uh, you know, when I first read it, I said, well, you know, the early stages and everybody's telling them to bring people to the pit. So that's probably what he did. But there was there was such a difference. Um, I don't know. I just found that odd and kind of strangely horrifying on its own. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, that that struck me as well. It, mm -hmm. it made me think that Matheson wasn't a father. He mm -hmm. kind of says that the the real loss for him would have been his lifelong relationship with his wife, but I don't think, as a parent, you would ever get over the loss of a child, and be okay of it, with it, you know, and, and kind of pigeonhole her otherwise. Like it's very much an afterthought, as you say. It's mm -hmm. Like she's going to school, and then he, when she died, it was just like whatever. I'll burn her, but but the <laughs> wife the wife oh i have to do something else with like and, I, and either you you make justification for a difference between them which he didn't really do or mm. you do something else with it i, the, the, I agree that was the bit that i kind of went mm, i you must not live this life you know in reality hmm. i mean it is a lose-lose yeah. situation you know hmm. it's <laughs> um <laughs> and you can't really uh know what kind of um family life he had there's not really that much room for ex exploration there um without making the lo novel longer and maybe having a lot of unnecessary stuff that would have made it not as slow as well but the uh in the in the science 
I, I love how he bumbled through the science because he's not a scientist, <laughs> right? He's looking at through the library and stuff, and he's trying to figure out stuff that's just not in his field of of uh, training at all. And uh, and uh, and I love how it, it brings up the the um, what he knows from popular culture about vampires, you know, mm-hmm. and the, the whole Gallic thing. And he's looking up Dracula, and he's and he's you know he's trying to figure out all these things and i thought it was uh i th- i thought it brought at least a little bit of of uh lightness you know mm-hmm. that cuz the story is very heavy mm-hmm. and um at least that brought a little bit of lightness to it to you know help us get through these yeah. this kind of depressing story you know is he's he, he's the last guy on the world mm-hmm. as far as he knows and mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh that's a lot of uh, heavy psychological um, stuff to deal with, which yeah. you know, which really compounds the horror of the situation uh, yeah. for yeah. for this character. Um, it's not just the the monsters that are the horror. It's 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 the situation. It's the loneliness. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's very powerful in that respect. And I think it's it feels to me more powerful than some of the some of the hack and slash zombie movies we've seen over the past 50 years or whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's what I really enjoyed about it. Did anyone uh, notice or, or maybe I misunderstood, but some of them did seem like pure zombies, like no conscious awareness, but then others did seem to be conscious. So what did anyone else pick up on that, that, that there were like two types yeah. of, people yeah i it sounded like from at least based on the characters descriptions that even those who come back from the dead have some sort of consciousness that their brain is still working and uh they're like his wife for instance remembered who he was and uh called him by name uh so you know they have a lot of functioning faculty so i guess I don't know, it's not really explored, but what does dead mean here if the bacteria is making the brain work again? Like that that was, I guess, an interesting aspect of it. That wasn't really explored, or I don't know if Maybe, yeah. wasn't it about a length of time thing? So it was how because the ladies that not rescued him but came to the house, rescued. they were taking tablets mm. to stop the progression of it. So I think it was length I think it was length of time. Was, mm. My memory serves. Oh, because they were talking about the, the zombies as being lost to their primal urges, so they were basically just feeding at that stage. Mm. Or they just wanted to feed, and, and they were basically saying that we're civilized, and that we are sort of setting up civilization again, but carrying this bacteria, carrying mm. this 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 bacilli, as it, as it was called. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and uh, why? Uh, this was a question that you know only occurred to me a while back, uh, while after. Uh, you know, if it was an inspiration for so many movies, and it's usually about finding the cure, and he was trying to find the cure, and he himself, you know, was the cure because he was the one immune. Why, um, you know, I know it would ruin the ending, and it's beautiful as it is, but it was the whole thing. Why, why are you taking those pills to, you know, manage this disease or this condition when you could try to find the cure? You have, you know, this person that is immune. You, you can work on it. I guess it would be a whole different story, but I just I can't help to, you know, consider yeah. saying, you know, what if? Hmm. Yeah, I think he sort of fudged up. I I could be wrong because I am not a medicine person, but antibiotics cure a disease, vaccines prevent disease. I think he sort of fudged both together in his explanation. I mean, it makes sense because the character is not a scientist or a doctor. So it makes sense that he would like not uh, make that mistake, I suppose. But he claimed that nothing he can do would help because uh, vaccines don't work. Sure, but antibiotics could. So um, I don't know what happened there. like you said, Susanna, like they could potentially use what he has to create antibiotics, perhaps. I don't know if that's how it works. But... 
that I, was, I that don't was, know either. That was, <laughs> that was that was that was the Am Legend movie, though. That's kind of what they did. I mean, oh, he yeah. did he did create the uh, the cure or whatever for it. In this case, I think. I think part of the visitation from Ruth, where she basically goes in a fact finding mission to see what he knows, basically tells mm. you that the expertise is gone out of the world. There is no expertise. He all of a sudden, this kind of not scientist is the mm. expert on this yeah. on this disease. And anything that they know before they were gonna kill him, they had drain out of him everything that they know so that they could then maybe take that forward and maybe do exactly what you were gonna say. But mm. there wasn't there wasn't any school for people to go get educated. There wasn't any any place for people to go other than these repositories or libraries. And at right. that stage, you know, self learning is quite hard. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing, the plague seems to have gone on for many, many years, which means possibly many biologists and scientists were still alive. And he, as a non-science person, bumbling around with uh, random blood samples, found uh, bacteria. So, isn't there possibly a case for you know the scientists found it too? And so, maybe the news media didn't do a good job of covering it or whatever. But he seems to have been doubtful of the fact that it was caused by bacteria in the first place, right? They, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Robin. No, I was, I was, I was just agreeing with your point. That's kind of what irked me a little bit. The fact that he's a complete non-scientist. He literally goes to the library and find, and then goes and gets a, a, a microscope and then finds this. And I was meant to believe that no other actual trained scientists got that far. Like <laughs> that, that's what annoyed me. Like you said, like it's not like everyone was wiped out in an instant. I get that you know, it took time and everything else, but he can't be mm. the only person who knows where a library is. That. That didn't really seem, but I mean, you know, go for the story and all that malarkey. But yeah, that could, yeah. That, that <laughs> could tie into to his own delusions of being alone mm. for so long that mm. you know he he thinks he's starting to think, well, I'm the only guy, so yeah. maybe that's part of his because uh, he, he never he never really actually really found anything. Mm. Yeah. You know, so mm. it, it yeah. was uh, it was a a cycle of failure basically. <laughs> mm. But, but both movie adaptations of Mega Man and I'm Legend is very clearly a scientist in both of those movies. They obviously mm-hmm. seen that as a as a weakness in the story as well. You know, they had to give it some sort of credence as to why he had done the idea that he was a <laughs> he was mm-hmm. immune because of this been being bitten by a vampire bat in Vietnam was just a little <laughs> bit right. The only person in the world has been bitten by this bat is like all right, okay. Uh, whereas in Omega Man, he kind of finds the cure discovers the cure in omega man and doesn't get the chance to distribute it before everybody dies out that's pretty mm. much the idea in omega man so yeah wow okay i did find it funny you know again thinking of the period that um the library was so miraculous just to have this exact information you know the exact books that are easy to read and <laughs> uh mm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And also, how did he know? Okay, uh, last thing I'll nitpick and then we'll move on to other <laughs> things. <laughs> uh, uh, how did he know what to look for? Because, you yeah. know, a sample has to be teeming with a lot of life forms. How did he know this is the vampire bacteria? Maybe, Jared, you're right. He was probably deluding himself on this. But then he did experiments where, you know, light destroyed the bacteria. and But he couldn't explain anything else. And his conclusion was... Uh, mass psychosis from what i understand so uh yeah i guess i guess there's room for interpretation there that uh, he didn't know as much as he thought he did <laughs> almost in the unreliable narrator kind of front mm. because you, he believes that he understands things and everything else one thing i did really enjoy though on the kind of his experimentation things and that was the the massacre is almost of the religious side mm-hmm. and the fact that the cross didn't work for people who yeah. weren't i loved that i thought that was, yeah. I thought that was, I thought that was such an interesting uh concept because i don't i've not read that many vampire books but no one else has gone down that road before well, i guess yeah. he was probably one of the first but um, yeah i thought that was a very interesting discussion point mm. yeah but it was almost like a retrofitted 
uh, answer that he put in. You know, that I, th- I wonder if Matheson did that on purpose because when he was doing the investigation, there was all this stuff that he couldn't get a rational explanation for, a scientific explanation. And the story was very much like, I don't know. I just don't, I don't have the expertise. What well, is the book evolved? They kind of like, well, that's obviously because, you know, of this thing. And we as the reader can go, yes, that, that, that's quite possibly right and, and all that kind of stuff. But again, it was, it was a, it was a supposition rather mm. than an actual proven scientific factor or otherwise. But yes, that bit was interesting, especially when he got to speaking to Ruth about it and he told her and she went, oh, of course. That I mean, that makes a 100% yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. But what about atheists? <laughs> <laughs> maybe didn't maybe exist. we have an encounter. <laughs> didn't exist the in feast. 1954. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I was laughing on that immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for the Hindus, which holy book would work? <laughs> yeah, you gotta have a whole bunch of them. If you only got invented in the nineties with grunge metal, you know that's just a big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that was cool though. I I agree with you, Robin. I did appreciate that. I think in the very beginning, uh, he asked a question about. Uh, would a Mohammedan vampire uh, respond to a cross? And then in the end, he sort of doubled down on that explanation. So I, I appreciated that, <laughs> that uh, they didn't assume that all people, all people who die and become vampires become Christian. <laughs> so it was more, in a way, psychological. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. yeah. That ties into his uh, mass psychological hypnosis type of thing (laughs) if he's trying to rationalize it in that way (laughs) but but but, uh, the bit that really makes it work is the fact that it's associated them with very severe trauma as their death and kind of rebirth comes along that they they hold on to these ideas of vampires they've been told Mm -hmm. for the younger and all that kind of stuff so the fear of the cross so i agree that bit was very cleverly done yeah yeah (laughs) that was great so what we touched upon it briefly, but what did you guys think about the mass psychosis aspect? Did that seem convincing to you, or just him sort of deluding himself because he didn't have an explanation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good. I, I mean, I, I would, I would tie it into him, him just trying to rationalize everything mm-hmm. around him because it, it's not making sense to him why why everything's working the way it does and you know and and why him even why him getting bit by a vampire bat would would uh you know give him the immunity to this thing yeah um you know a lot of it is left up to i think up to us to read it to try to yeah put our own thoughts into it and say you know and, and just think about all the stuff he's been through and it, it, it try to rationalize it right along with him as the story mm. goes along, you know? Yeah. 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 I think it's one of the more underlying themes through the, the book. What is the long-term effects of mass trauma? You know, so mm. repeated, repeated, repeated mass trauma. You know, does every little step come back? And, and in the case of even his wife, it wasn't enough that he had, that she died. Actually, the, the, the chapter where she died and he talks through his grief from the period of grief, I think is absolutely yeah. magnificently written at this top of that whole like three pages that, that he does that as he's sitting at the edge of the bed. But him then kind of knowing that he's breaking the law by by burying her, mm-hmm. him putting it to bed and then the door wrapping. Like yeah. they, they don't even play yeah. too much with that, but we as the reader kind of go, oh my God. Yeah. Like there's just yeah. another moment of just a pure trauma that you would never get over. But he just has this repeatedly do it and then going out and murdering yeah. hundreds of these these vampires day after day you know it's just, you know what way does that play on your mm. conscience what way does that feed into your value system and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. The, um i think i was wondering before we got to that point whether he had uh killed his wife and child the way uh mm. he's been killing the other vampires and I felt good when he went and buried her that, you know, we've seen her, seen him visit her grave there. So, uh, like we're done and dusted with that. So nothing traumatic happened with his daughter and his wife, but then she came back first. That was terrifying in and of itself, but then he had to deal with her the same way he did the other vampires and he's just sort of learning how to deal with them. Right. Like it was in the very early stages. He doesn't have his 
process down and efficient like he has it now so he probably tried a lot of things so it yeah it must not have been a good experience it, it's a lot to deal with maybe maybe mm. that's why he's constantly thinking about her more than his daughter later on i did wonder about that too like he's yeah, uh, just the true. burial aspects his daughter was like less <laughs> importantly treated but also later on his daughter's not much in his thoughts but his wife is all the time so yeah i did wonder about that <laughs> I think also, I was, I was thinking about that question a minute ago about the whole difference between his wife and daughter, that when his daughter dies, his wife is there to support him. Mm -hmm. And also, as you said, he's feeling protocol, but then having the trauma on the trauma. Yeah. So his wife dying on top of the trauma he's already yeah. had and then having to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I think I agree with you, Vash. I think that's definitely kind of like just, it kind of shows the escalation of mm -hmm. all the crap he's had to deal with. So maybe that's why, exactly that, why he, he has more of a uh, connection to his wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. And it, even then, his own reaction to viewing trauma, like, because he's committed all the trauma on people for the past, like, three years in the book. Mm -hmm. And it's only at the very end of the book when he sees them actually butchering these people down that he goes, This isn't right. Mm -hmm. What are you? You are barbaric. Like, mm -hmm. and, he, and he hasn't got the, the sense to kind of kind of look at it through his, his own lens because he's he's taken all the mirrors down in the, in the room <laughs> you know he, he doesn't believe in mirrors anymore that was a pop culture tale that that didn't burn out but also that he didn't have to look at himself and i think that uh, there's that allegory and metaphor that runs through the book of cracking the mirrors getting rid of the mirrors so that he wouldn't mm -hmm. have to face who he is yeah oh interesting yeah, yeah and it, it's funny how he he looked like the monster yeah. when yeah. he was uh, yes. when he was you know chasing down the, the woman that he saw her, mm -hmm. uh, from right. the there and he looked like the monster in at that point and um i don't know what what do you guys make of that whole scenario where like she was trying to f like fool him in or something like that you know mm -hmm. into the into their group and that's she was a whole new type of vampire we really hadn't seen yet like way more self-aware and way more you know not not like his neighbor who was just calling out his name all the time mm -hmm. um, and uh that and that was like what three or four years later or something like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh so are these creatures evolving or is that that the sense you got yeah that they're, they're evolving and he uh was devolving it, yeah it, yeah in a way yeah. <laughs> yeah so which uh made the ending so wonderful because um uh, maybe he was the uh he was a legend or the mythical being you know at the end um yeah and, and that ties into matheson's uh one of his themes in here is like basically what is normal that's mm -hmm. You know, because that changes everything mm. that's normal changes over time, and it there's always a new normal and a new normal. Now he's not the normal; he's the unique. He's the you know the legend, and mm. uh, that was it. Was just I thought it was expertly done how it it switched like that and it evolved like that as the yeah. vampires evolved and as he evolved the other direction. I guess. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the explanation we got there was that the bacteria mutated and they maybe got a less virulent version of it. So they got perhaps less sick. Because he has a realization at the end of the a chapter that bacteria can mutate. That That's all he says about that. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what happened there. But um, I was curious, there were, um, there were some, I guess, statements made, so to speak, about the nature of society that would form up at the end of an event like this with uh, the some of the new vampires uh, coming all guns blazing to destroy him and they seem to enjoy killing. And they are, they used to be the hunted both by Robert to a certain extent, but mostly by the other vampires and they enjoy killing as much as apparently Robert did too, because we know that he hated them and enjoyed when they died. Um, so what what do you think of that? Do you think that that's sort of 
an inevitable societal structure in something like this? Is he saying something about like base nature that we revert to if everything collapses? What did you all think about that? I have lots of things to say about this. Um, <laughs> there is that battle at the end between the value system, or again, that question that Jared talked about, you know, what is humanity or what is normal? As mm -hmm. we're saying, you know, what, what what is it that makes us human? And the fact that he's very judgment common, judgmental coming from a place where he remembers and still very much the last human on earth mm -hmm. and the value system that went with the church. The value system that went with having a work job a family all of that kind of stuff and then being confronted with this group of young men in a world that's very vicious mm -hmm. because their their job is to go out and kill and, and help us survive and within the function of society that's a very important job and of course they enjoyed it in the same way that you sort of enjoyed it because you felt like you were doing good and mm -hmm. uh, he thought he was saving humanity by doing that without ever having a plan of or reason that actually at the end of it, if he, if he died, because he wasn't procreating, mm -hmm. and he killed all the vampires, there was nobody left. There was no life whatsoever, whether it's vampiric or human, he hadn't he hadn't got that stage. So that kind of idea that society evolves to whatever it needs to be, and the people like back in medieval times, even further back, prehistoric times, the hunters were the, were the people that were the saviors of um, society. They were the people that were important. And obviously we sort of abhorred a violence, did a lot, more uh, more mm. recent to saddle times. Mm. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. And from a story perspective, so we ended up being the villain. Mm. Um, in that which I thought was a nice twist. Yeah, it's all about perspective, I guess. What is normal, what is right, uh, what is uh, justified. Um, yeah. Lots of questions in such a Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, um, the new vampires who were hunting down were they still also they're hunting him, but were they also hunting the older kind of vampires as well? Mm -hmm. All right. So th so there at least was a because um, if they just killed him and then that was it, then what you know. Uh, would they feed on themselves, or would they? Uh, so, but there was at least still a prey, so to speak, for mm -hmm. that type of society to um, have a, a you know a, an other or opponent, um, and uh, mm -hmm. which you know those those warfare and that kind of a situation usually leads to some sort of innovation to further uh, further a society along. Um, because otherwise, what would they do uh, other than probably turn on themselves? <laughs> yeah. Mm. You yeah. know, just a minor thing, too, about the feeding and all of that. You know, after reading that a couple of times, and then he goes and gets himself a steak to cook. I don't know if anybody knows it. I don't know. I, I know this, like, okay, kind of the, I mean, I'm not a, vegetarian or anything really but uh i don't know i just picked up on that that um maybe he's trying to say something there about being a carnivore and <laughs> yeah. yeah i forgot about that that was that was brilliant <laughs> yeah, yeah. i had a question for the guys of this group as well what did you find because i didn't really understand the whole random sexuality issues he was having and his like almost crazedness about the women in the books even the female vampires and i didn't really i was like what on earth but mm. i don't know if you as a guy if i found that read that differently than i would have done as a female i'm not sure because i found that super weird i, can't, I kind of feel like letting jared go first <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, I just Sorry, I don't know, I kind of viewed it as a uh, <laughs> as a kind of a um, hyper realization for companionship um, mm -hmm. you know I um, you know he yeah it's it's hard to put it in to anything else other than that uh, yeah. you know he's he's been by himself for I forget how many years it was before mm. the story started. Because uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember how long it was before. 
to the flashbacks. Um, I'm assuming it was at least a few years that he's been by it's, himself. It was originally five months, and then it was three years. I think was the was the with, yeah. with the gaps in the book. Uh, and so it's just, I think it's just another um, another expression of loneliness, really. Uh, you know, maybe Matheson um, was uh, putting it in a way that guys would maybe relate to better i'm not sure i, <laughs> I think i think you're being very kind i'm being very kind it, yeah very mm. kind looking at it in a kind of hyper i get i think loneliness and companionship is very different to what he was in my view is what he was describing i was always scared that he was gonna essay the lady when he uh like to that point i was just like what the hell is he gonna do with her yeah so uh, well, that's i just a good point because he um he has these thoughts and and eventually he he found the woman in the field and went after her uh and yeah there was a point where if this book was written nowadays it might have been it might have led straight into sexual assault and what have you but um i'm not sure matheson would have gone there in the 1950s because he wouldn't have sold a book <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, oh yeah there's the theme of um him remaining uh his last bastion of civilization and so there's kind of a theme of well if he does open that door and goes out he ha you know that's the end of civilization really so him fighting those instincts i kind of wish that it went first <laughs> <laughs> I I think it was quite realistic in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, this man is drunk 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's and alcohol, for good or for bad, accentuates kind of the edges of emotions quite quite a lot of the time. And I, I sort of... I sort of equated it a bit to, if you think back to Book 4 of The Expanse, Elvie when she was actually frustrated and kind of it affected her judgment center uh, and where she was like, she couldn't function and think she fascinated and holding for a lot part of that because of her sexual frustration. It was very, very like that, without giving spoilers too much for that book and how he processed it. But by the time Ruth came along, his sexual being or that part of his body was actually quailed and dead. You know, it was dead at that stage. He felt like he should be sexually attracted to her. And it was only the touch aspect of it that started to come back in it wasn't like a, he was looking across the, the street he was uh, to me when he was locked inside in, in solitude and in, in this house he's thinking about all the things that he couldn't have and he couldn't be and mm. the things that would never happen for him for the rest of his life and he's uh, for me he's looking at the vampires that are the females going i never experienced that kind of intimacy your relationship ever, ever again and they knew it, and they think this is a way to get him to come outside because they really had nothing else. He was going out and murdering them in, in, in large numbers. They kept on sending women to him because they mm -hmm. knew that women were sort of going to have an effect on him in some way, on a primal level. So, I, I, I know what you mean but in terms of it's a bit, a bit weird, but I also think it kind of fit with the character as being this very flawed. I think it was one of the reasons that he was he came across as very flawed and very problematic was because you kind of went. He's not exactly somebody you'd want to spend 10 minutes in the company of either at any given time. Mm. You know, he's not, he's not exactly, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. Given, given the amount of focus on it in the beginning, I was sure that there's some sort of implication that, you know, maybe he has the disease, but in some much milder form or something, and it's a symptom. But, like, I, I felt like it had to have an input to the plot somehow, but... I, I was disappointed when it didn't, and I didn't know what to make of it. So I'm glad, Robin, you asked the question. So, yeah, it, it makes sense, I suppose, how you put it, Chris. Yeah, I think ultimately it's his biggest weakness. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that this this intimacy and this, this female companionship is his b biggest weakness is why, you know, the dog comes along, he puts his heart and soul in the dog, but when the dog dies, it's it's okay. Mm. You know, and but the fact of losing this woman actually... As being the last bastion of him ever having intimacy is actually a real problem for him you know mm. a little crush him yeah yeah and he's he's probably lost a lot of uh social graces i guess you know mm. 
he may have lost how to act mm. over that long period. Um, yeah, that's. I mean, it does tie into his his uh, his behavior later on when he when he uh, does chase her down. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> There, there was a line in there about how if it had been a year or two ago that he had found her, he would have yes. violated her for sure or something to that effect. And but that once I got over my anger at that statement, I was wondering what that was about, because he doesn't seem like even for someone who has been living uh, that has uh, alone for three years, I guess. Uh, sexual desire has to be like at the top of what, the things he wants for it for him to have to behave that way or to even entertain those thoughts to himself like he still has some sort of moral code it seems like um and or maybe he's at the point where everything is okay because like who's there to judge it wasn't as if he was taking these bodies before he killed them uh, and doing a necrophilia thing with them, you know, that definitely wasn't what was happening there, but he mm -hmm. definitely had a, a sense that it's companionship and intimacy, like it, at the very end when he met Ruth, he was kind of surprised how the curve of her breast, for instance, was something that he noticed, he had probably mm -hmm. some he hadn't thought about in a very long time mm -hmm. as being something that's alluring or attractive to him and mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I feel like I should be more sexually interested in this person mm -hmm. and literally it's like Again, I think one of the points is like that kind of looking and objectifying is nothing without the intimacy of the touch and the hold. You know, it was mm. only when he get touched and they get held that, that that it became, oh, this is something real for me now. Mm. These these feelings are very different. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe that needed to be there so we could explore that aspect mm. of it. Yeah. I think it fits with his whole, you know. I mean, I think trauma and emotional issues go in cycles. And mm -hmm. so he, you know, we, we've seen him now go through different phases and cycles. So overall, I, I think it was, you know, relevant to the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone mentioned the dog. Uh, what did you all think of that? I think that for me was up there with the scene of the wife's dying uh, in terms of like how heart wrenching it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I said. Yeah. I don't know about anybody else. Did anybody else feel when you got another character for him to converse with, in this case, just a dog, yeah. how much more the pages and the conversation and, of it, and the story just flowed very quickly mm -hmm. in that in that sense, uh, as opposed to the kind of stop start nature of his day and kind of the times of day and the period. I thought that was very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was a major event that yeah. came into the story all of a sudden and we're mm -hmm. like, oh, oh, what's going on? Yeah. What's happening? Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's funny how a dog can, uh, change the, the course yeah. of your your yeah. interest in the in the, what's going on <laughs> right. yeah. and and the possibility of it i guess the bleakness would reduce if the dog had survived i was hoping that he would which he didn't but he died too quickly i thought it would take a while or uh, we'd get into some mad heroics where with all his research he'd find a way to cure the dog but no it just died it was just as like mundane as that which i thought was <laughs> Yeah, it is a great way to tell a story, but really disappointing. <laughs> I fully agree. I, I thought the dog, I don't think, I can't, in the film, just because it's, it's his companion in the film, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I immediately thought, oh, great, he's got a companion. It's all going to be <laughs> wonderful. And then you're right, it happened so quickly. It was just like, oh, it's here. Oh, it's happy. Oh, we're sad again. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, again, it was a very, very bleak book. <laughs> But the dog's not there long enough for us to really get devastated because I think if the dog had been there around the time the dog dies somewhere in the middle of the book, you don't get the emotional payoff then at the end of the, end of the mm -hmm. book. You don't get the, that the, the point that he's, I think, that he's trying to make towards the end about what is humanity. The dog kind of confuses that mm -hmm. question, but it does give us that that sense of how living and things living and making decisions and kind of being afraid and all of those other emotions that aren't in the book because you've got these kind of faceless zombies the dog yeah. mirrors those for us uh, in ways that he isn't because he doesn't really ever seem to be afraid he just has this existential dread 
until the very end of the book, I suppose. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I like how. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, well, I like how we're constantly reminded by by um, the the narrative that Robert has to constantly stamp down his hope, like. You know, don't get mm. caught up in wild dreaming, and mm. you know, because he he can't let himself have too much, or else it's going to be too devastating. If 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 it uh, when it when it eventually doesn't um, happen, mm. uh, and uh, how like and how he just got so used to the horror around him, and that the monotony of the of his existence is what truly was his horror so he couldn't depend on any kind of wild dreaming or hoping mm -hmm. that was just i i love how uh matheson really played upon that theme throughout the whole thing yeah, yeah. like it's, uh, I, I love how he did his uh, inner monologues um his mm -hmm. thought process you know, some genius moments i remember taking notes back then uh, so well done mm -hmm. And that whole theme of purpose, like what what change does purpose in life give you? Like yeah. the only time that he stopped drinking and he started looking after himself was when he was doing the investigation. He became sort of alive again, uh, yeah. and it had a vivacity to himself. Whereas all the rest of the time, he was bemoaning his monotony, but also bemoaning the fact God when he found out the sun liked to kill the vampires. I wasted so much time, darling. Like I could have mm -hmm. had that time back as <laughs> if he was going to do something else with that time. Right. You know, he wasn't doing anything else with it, but he, but he was he was very much resentful of the fact that he had wasted all that time, even though there was a at a day to day you know time mm -hmm. scale that he that he laid out for us. Uh, but actually, once his his progress with the cure stalled, he reverted. Then he was back to drinking. He was back to mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. the wild yeah. man. Yeah. yeah. I think even in the very beginning, when he uh, says to himself that he'll make a, a make the room soundproof, and then he just doesn't get to it, a man with nothing but time on his hands is still doing, you know, what <laughs> I would do: make plans and then <laughs> and not do it. Four months later, it's still on my to-do list. <laughs> So, I thought that was really interesting actually, because <laughs> it ties to this. Um, I guess. Uh, how the depression, I suppose, in uh, just having to do this day to day and not want, not being able to get around to be more productive. Just, yeah, that, I thought that was very interesting too. And that, it really was, and I think it showed the, the bleakness of his mind because it was something that would basically improve his existence, but mm -hmm. he was just so unwilling. It just was yeah. improving his existence wasn't important to him, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, that was a very interesting uh, way. Yeah, yeah, his monologue, how he's mm -hmm. talking through it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until he was nearly killed that he kind of goes, I, I should do something about this now. You know, yeah. this is... This is this it was, around. that was also quite interesting as well, because it, it it, it's very very bleak to the point of like you're not sure whether he actually really cares about being alive or not and then he does he finds out he does care that he wants to be alive and obviously it doesn't end out mm -hmm. very well but he kind of re yeah re finds the fact that actually yeah he doesn't he would not he'd prefer not to be dead <laughs> mm -hmm. which you don't always see the whole way through yeah he he keeps wondering i thought that was really poignant that you know why does he keep carrying on and he has to like I don't know, there's some deeper instinct that keeps him alive, I suppose, to the point where he go to the library and do research. Um, yeah, he's depressed on many levels because he's lost his family and everyone around him. But Yeah, I think part of the point is that mm -hmm. as monotonous as, ex as his existence is, that survival instinct yeah. runs very deep. And mm -hmm. I think he's starting to see that survival instinct in the vampires later on too. They mm -hmm. want to live as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did anyone else feel chills uh, in that flashback scene when he sits in the car and Ben Cotman, that's his name, mm -hmm. um, yeah. says, hi, Robert. <laughs> and uh, because we are so used to seeing him as this terrifying <laughs> creature, when he, we actually see him in a proper setting, it's still vaguely scary at least i felt pretty <laughs> scared when i read that bit no it was i thought he was a great 
secondary character, mm. I guess. Because the way you're introduced to him is of this, like, almost ringleader with the bad guys, almost. <laughs> and then have that. And then you get back and find out that it was his neighbor and he had this whole, like, neighborly relationship. And then it gets to the point at the end where he's like, they better not kill him because I wanted to yeah, kill him. Yeah. Like, it's his it's his friend sort of mm-hmm. thing. That he doesn't want anyone else to, to, to die. I thought that was, um, at the end, I was I like, that odd relationship mm. they have was really, really interesting. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But it's it's part of the humanizing or the demonstrifying of the characters as you're going through. I mean, we're just told they're vampires that they feed on their own. They send people out to die, you know, for enjoyment or purposes. But ultimately, that was a person. That was a friend. Mm. That was his neighbor he used to check on. That he the last time that he seen him before that happened, he went in and his wife and his and Ben and his wife were sitting in single beds in that kind of mummified state, you know. And you kind of go, oh god, this is mm. this is more trauma. This yeah. is yeah. like how do you recover from that one thing? Never mind all of these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Nobody else freaked out by the fact that it could very easily happen. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if COVID didn't affect just the elderly, I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, mm. it was. It was an interesting book to read post pandemic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially the means of communication, right? Assuming that he's right about the dust storms being the primary carriers, which also nuclear apocalypse and giant grasshoppers and possibly mosquitoes and other mutations. That was interesting. (laughs) So this is basically a post-apocalyptic zombie land. But yeah, yeah, the yeah it was interesting to read after covid yeah Yeah. especially those kind of ideas when no when covid hit and the city centers and etc were all uh empty and there were like deer walking about new york city and people this is the earth healing itself you know this was yeah Yeah, there were a lot of empty streets and uh, it definitely had that uh end of the world movie feel when you're looking at some of the news footage you know that's right um Mm -hmm. so it's uh yeah, no, it's it was very relevant to that current situation to pick this up now, you know, yeah. and, and uh, just just you know, it's 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 you know way more fantastical than mm. um, what would what did happen or what will actually happen, but it still makes you think about it. And mm. it's, uh, pretty mm-hmm. cool that way. Yeah. Did you guys think that? Because again, I don't think I realised quite how old this book was, but obviously this I saw a lot of. It was weird for me because having read the other ones first or or seen the other ones first, uh, a lot of the references that people have used later on, uh, come from this, and I was just like, it was like light bulbs going off, like oh that and all oh, this and that's been used elsewhere and stuff, and realising this yeah. is probably one of the first places where it actually was written and taken from. Mm. So I don't know if you guys um, thought that at all. Yeah. Have any of you read The Girl with All the Gifts? No, that is so close to this storyline. It's crazy. Mm. I was just like, "Oh my god, she basically <laughs> stole the whole storyline." <laughs> so I thought that was it. But yeah, I recommend that if you have read that. <laughs> yeah, no, I wanted that myself. Like, how mm-hmm. much of stuff that came after was uh, like because y- you could see this, like you see Dawn, like Dawn of the Dead. That's one of the classic zombie movies, right? Mm. You know, and that's has that same feel of people mm. running from undead, even though these are vampires and these are these aren't like the slow brain eating ones. But, um, <laughs> but it, you know, how much other stuff was influenced by this, and where did all these classifications of undead come from? Uh, it mm. made me made me think about that a lot. Mm. Mm. I think the idea of a survivalist too, of someone who's fortified their basically suburban home, you know, Um, because there's always been stories of people living out in the woods or whatever, you know, but the idea of of being in a suburb and having like this, you know, encampment with uh, and being self-sufficient. I don't know when that was first done or if this is one of the first times Mm. Set a story because yeah. I thought of The Last of Us too, you know. Um, mm. Mm. Very strong um, allegories there. 
Yeah, I was going to bring up The Last of Us when you were talking about how the virus spread because I thought The Last of Us did that so, so well. Of course, <laughs> yeah. yeah, with the food, the food chain. I thought it was a much better way around of describing it than a dust storm. But, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's good. Cool. I was also thinking of Zombieland because a lot of the going to department stores, stealing cars, <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, other things looked very similar. And warm bodies, I suppose, because of how they eventually find out well sorry uh spoilers for the movie so i won't say anything <laughs> <You're good. laughs> um what was i gonna say yes susanna you said that you really loved the ending so uh do you want to talk a little bit about what you thought was so well done with it oh the, when the title finally made sense mm-hmm. um <laughs> <laughs> and at the end. Um, no, it was the, the sudden s- shift in perspective mm-hmm. when you get the whole picture and you realize what's going on. I mean, it, it is enough to forgive all the science and aggressions and, mm-hmm. and just the whole I- idea. And it, it's no wonder that so many other movies, books, and so many stories were adapted from there, the, from that, that little idea. Uh, that it was huge. Um, mm-hmm. I, I love it. I love that um, shift. I I could see it coming, but it, it, it was really the when when the title hit um, mm-hmm. that it was the creature of myth. That, and so that for me was, uh, was mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I accidentally got a peek at the last page while I was still in the middle of the book. And I was wondering if he is just celebrating the fact that he found a cure or something mm. like that. When that didn't happen, <laughs> it was <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say you're one of those monsters that reads the last two pages of a book oh, when, I, before you start. <laughs> I, I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I do sometimes spoil myself for a story if it's like really flagging and I want to figure out whether I should keep going. But no, what I do but do very frequently. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> what I do very often is check. Oh, how much more do I have? Or uh, if I read up to this page, how, how far? Like, like how long yeah. is this chapter? And then I'll accidentally read some stuff and. I couldn't help but notice the title. Yeah, <laughs> the end, of the book. <laughs> yeah. end of the book for me is very much about whether we, as the reader, accept that there is a future for mm. life on the planet. You know, and again, that question of what is humanity? Is this important? And to me, I, well, I've written down my notes. What is the one characteristic in humanity that will tell us that it's going to be OK? Mm. And for me, it's compassion is the one that I've written down. The fact that you'd have care for somebody else's somebody else's welfare and that they want the blood, they want to see a hanging or a lynching and they were saved from it because it actually wouldn't do, it wasn't good for the individual or the struggle that he'd had. She recognized his struggle and actually, for, even though her husband was killed by a mental arrest, that there was real compassion in there. And I think we as the reader kind of go, okay, there's a future for this world. There is a... Um, it was a mm. destination that, that going forward in time they could recover from this and rebuild society i think her whole introduction to that and how she dealt with it and how she tried to warn him was showing you that even though she was infected that, that it wasn't going to go into like some sort of savage thing. she was still kind of what you would recognize as humanity which i think i guess is the whole reason that she was um she was brought in like that because yeah, you're right. Otherwise, you would it, you would be so hopeless that it just basically would be over. Because you didn't see any of those exactly humanitarian traits in in the group that he met and stuff. So, right. mm. yeah, it was horrifying, but I did feel uh, a hope um, there. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. I I don't think the movie the, the movie the book <laughs> works without hope in there mm-hmm. it had to insert mm-hmm. hope in there for for it to be effective for us to think that the struggle has to be worth it at the end of the day mm-hmm. it has to be you know the reason there's a reason to keep fighting there's a reason to keep surviving to create a point where you know things can be rebuilt or... yeah mm-hmm. did it in some ways that his struggle was pointless because he at the end of the day got nothing out of it except to maybe view himself as a monster but the others are struggling 
similarly to what he was. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the point that is being made, but is it an interpretation? Well, you could read into it that this, like these, this is a new species, really. Mm -hmm. That's created here, and that this this is the end of humanity. It, you know, the end of Homo sapiens. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, that um, that we're just that he is just dying off as a species, like others, like dinosaurs have, like other species have in the past. And that uh, if you, it, it could be interpreted that way. Mm -hmm. But that he, he also he played the role in. Um, in their society, in unifying them, uh, mm. because they, they had to, to work together to to bring him down. So mm. there was also that because you know he was the monster mm. uh, from their perspective. So in, in a sense, right. maybe he helped build that society, helped them become, um, yeah, a little bit more mm. civilized or I'm not say human, but a different type of. Mm -hmm. human with the mm -hmm. similar principles like you said compassion was there so that you know, that is hope for a for a new kind of humanity mm -hmm. and it's not the age-old question isn't it of why i can i know i've had students to pass come why, why do they keep on looking to space for like and alien races and stuff and i would say like because as soon and if they ever find anything all our petty squabbles become mm -hmm. meaningless you know Differences over religion, all of that kind of stuff. That matters you none. Think? I no. think it would just become even more permanent. <laughs> well, I, I think that's what the expanse kind of says. <laughs> a little bit, I think that's what it's arguing. But I think if, if we're going to face unless that, they yeah. attack us, yeah. Yeah, it's, look, it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, once you get over the wonder, the squabbles will come back. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and what did they do in the expanse? Again, they attacked each other first. You know, they pretty much destroyed her so in another mm -hmm. yeah I, I i can see that happening <laughs> well you know i i've thought like how covid kind of was it was another life form mm -hmm. impacting us you know and um people had different reactions to that <laughs> and this is really the same a similar idea like we were just saying about the you know like a pandemic coming and mm -hmm and uh, having society break down so just a lot to think about there mm. well yeah. it, it did change our society you know, to a you know, considerable yeah. degree how we work how we interact how uh, yeah it wasn't on a um, global extinction um <sighs> level but uh yeah lives were changed forever our society has changed forever mm and how the bats are responsible in both stories like the, i don't know yeah, yeah. <laughs> we pick a great time to start this yeah <laughs> that's gonna bad rap <laughs> <laughs> was it convenient that it was a vampire bat yeah that made it <laughs> okay it, that, that that was kind of my only uh, you know my major issue with the book was how the vampires were portrayed uh, that, that was the thing that i almost dnf because it was like these are not vampires these are zombies with fangs what are you doing yeah. um and then i had to remind myself that this was written in the 50s and it was you know basic uh, it, it, it was uh, his idea of vampire was dracula and the dracula in, in the books is not the dracula no it's not gary oldman it's um it, you know it's so you have to, I had to put it in that context so I wouldn't get mm. angry. Um, other than that, <laughs> it was fine. But also their interpretation of these, uh, I guess, evolved or like different creatures, because they seem to have some genetic modifications too, because they have different teeth and so mm. on. Um, the, mm. it feels the bacteria like some... elongates the teeth. Yeah, that, that part is genius, <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Just, uh, sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it seems to be a myth propagated by, you know, we saw a scene where uh, he has a run in with some members of the church and uh, they are saying vampires have come to attack us because, you know, I don't know, we're being sinful or whatever. Um, so it seems to be something that maybe if it hadn't been for those religious mythologies, they would think about it more as a scientific problem but they're thinking of them as vampires because of how they look and 
how they act and also did we ever we didn't actually see <laughs> obviously because uh he's the last man living see them you know suck blood out of each other but was that implied that they did do that uh did they um he said he claimed that that was one of the vectors for spreading the disease right anyway yeah but i think it was interesting uh the i think the vampire interpretation of the sick people probably was propagated by some maybe potentially religious elements or the mythological aspects just like fear propagated it they weren't true vampires perhaps yeah Cool. I'd like to talk about the music. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Classic music. So the classic music, the fact is a classic music fan. I went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> did you listen to all the pieces he did too? I, well, I knew some of them and I listened to the other ones and then I looked up the notes for what they represent. Mm. So I only did a couple of them, right? <laughs> but the first three that are announced that I'd listened to the third, the seventh and the ninth symphonies of beethoven right so third symphony the eroica which is my favorite uh is the symphony that he wrote about bonaparte right mm -hmm. so it's about tyranny and, a, and about uh the representation of power and power decentralized from a government kind of idea so you can use that whatever way you want seventh is like a rhythm and, and about the vivacity and nature of life so how nature plays with him and ninth is well his own, it ends in his own joy and this kind of hope thing at the end it's nearly the plot of the book the third the seventh and the ninth mm -hmm. from start to nice. finish you know the way through uh the one that he's listening to to drown out the, the noise of the vampires is an atonal piece with a repeating like monotonous line in it interesting that he would use like a droning noise to mm -hmm. drone out another noise and he destroys a record in it called the year of the plague and the year of the plague is not a real record it's the only one that doesn't actually exist from all the pieces of music that are that are in there and it's the one that he destroys which i think is kind of interesting in its own right so i'm sure there are more bits in it but i just thought the choice of the pieces of music that he that did that he did kind of had led more meaning mm. to the story that's fascinating yeah uh, no I'm, I'm gonna have to go and investigate that <laughs> yeah yeah same here i didn't even go to look them up i was just like cool that's a nice yeah. reference. Yeah. Let's not Google it. Yeah. <laughs> really lends credence to everything on the page's intention. <laughs> right. Lesson number thousand why I could never write a book. <laughs> 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 I ain't doing that. Yeah, no, I, that's that's great. I uh, didn't yeah. think about that that much. Yeah, thanks for looking that up, Chris. That that was awesome. That added so much color to the book. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was just like I I just kind of thought. Like why why the third, the seventh, the ninth? As soon as I seen that, I was like, there's a reason why you would only pick those three. Otherwise mm -hmm. you would just write the Beethoven symphonies or one of mm -hmm. Beethoven symphonies or something like that. I was like, right, there's a reason mm -hmm. why he's picked literally these three things Whatever. out. You know? yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. <clears throat> That's cool. Were there any other subjects we left out? Anything else that anyone would like to bring up? I have two quotes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first one's from chapter three, and it's where he says the strength of the vampire is that no one will believe in him. Which again, mm -hmm. this idea yeah. of him as the legend and uh, otherwise. Yeah. And oh. this, the second one was the idea of this idea, and it's his own problem with this. The line is personal death still was a thing beyond his comprehension or beyond his own comprehension. The fact that for all that he's been living in a world where death has been at his door every mm. night and all the rest of them, but it was only when he was faced with the point where he thought i am going to die that he just couldn't face it he got very afraid his, pri his primal part of him came out he had mm. to grab the bunny granny had to attack the men who were breaking into his house because he couldn't take the chance that they were just coming to take him peacefully or otherwise and i thought those those two th those two sentences were ones that i picked out and went they they have multiple meanings throughout these the story yeah yeah, yeah. yep uh, isn't that that uh that the uh, the believing in the vampire one uh, isn't wasn't that in Dracula as well? Oh, it might have been yeah. um, the novel because yeah. uh, that's Probably. that was out of his power as well. That that people yeah. didn't want to believe in him. 
Well, it's that I, idea I, the boogeyman, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I haven't I haven't read the book in a while, and I remembered that quote, and I was thinking, oh, yeah, maybe it's. it's fun. Yeah, it's been a long time. I, 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 I like vampires. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah, that's good. And I like the, uh, there was one line that said, uh, understanding, he was talking about the monotony, and he was like, understanding that gave him that sort of quiet peace. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, uh, and of course, that peace was, wasn't long lasting, but it, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it just related to when you understand anything that's happening to you in, in life you get a little bit more peace about it than when you're confused and you're, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you're trying to make sense of what's happening. Um, so it was, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a nice line. I thought. Yeah. Here's a question. If you had to rank the two books of read so far, if you've read both of them, which one's the better book? Oh, mm -hmm. If, I, if we were to start to do like a top 10, if we were to go through all 180 of these books, right, and do a top 10, <laughs> we're, uh, even two books in, how would you rank them? It's very, very difficult. Then. A top two. A top yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's first and second? Mm. I really think this, for me, uh, I Am Legend would go first. I, I think because how subtle it was, uh, you know, so that the payoff of the twist was so good. Um, but I might change my mind later. But but right now, that's where I. That's where mm. I stay. I'm trying to remember. I, I know I, I I checked it today. I gave I am Legend four stars. But I think I gave the Forever World five. Um, but as I was a lot more demanding in my ratings, I guess back then. Um, no, I. <laughs> I know that. Maybe I would put it this uh, I Am Legend second, just because it is shorter and um, without that ending. Um, I don't know. I, I don't say that it wouldn't make sense, but as a novel, I mean, it, it reads more like a novella. It's, I, I don't know. So, yeah, mm. I, I will stick to my rating. Mm. I love both books, but I and this could be complete recency bias, but I think I'd put I'm Legend first. Mm -hmm. I think like both books are incredibly strong thematically, which is yeah. like my favorite, 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 favorite thing in, mm -hmm. in, in, in reading. But there's just it's the examination of the human in this and the character, whereas Forever War doesn't really do characters and so much it looks kind of societal stuff. And this one looks at the individual. They're almost like a an opposite of each other in, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah. Yep. So, so I'll probably put Diamond Legend first. <laughs> you know I want this one first. You, you already know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think. I, oh. oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Drum. No, I was going to say I didn't read the other one because I was away. I didn't, I didn't have to get through it. But now, if we're going to have to rate them all as we're going along, I'll now have to go back and read it <laughs> just to make sure I can add them all in. <laughs> it's worth the read, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a good book. What? Well, sorry, Chris, you were saying. I was just going to say um, that I like both books after having these discussions, though, so regardless mm -hmm. of what my That's... initial feelings were on them. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Definitely, the discussions added a lot more to both books. Yeah. I did rate like Susanna four stars for this one and uh, five stars for the Forever War, but the four stars was because the uh, sexual fantasy stuff really bothered me. Uh, <laughs> but I uh, got different uh, perspective on that after talking to you all. So I think I think it's down to the character work and 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 by that I mean you know uh, we talked in the Forever War about how um, I forget his name but the Mandela. main character hmm? Mandela. Mandela. Yes. Mandela. He's sort of this uh, bland person who is just a pawn in the course of war and this guy seems to have personality he listens to music he loves his wife and has a lot to uh, for us to sort of try and find connections with him about so I guess from that perspective he this was a more easy read for me 
but I think in terms of the themes that it touches upon, the forever war um, feels like the more important book to me. <laughs> Leia, did you go already and say which one you prefer? Yeah, okay. yeah sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, cool. Anything else? The next book looks good. Yes. Speaking of, I didn't realize um, it was that long. It is big. <laughs> so it is actually a bind up of four books. Um, it's the complete series. And so we will do the first two books and then the next month and then the next two books the month after. So we will be reading Cities in Flight up to October. Oh, okay. So the four short. That yeah, the four short, short books. Long. Yeah. The four short books. <laughs> they make up 600 old pages. Yeah. These, these books have a pretty small font. <laughs> yes, they do. Oh. Yeah. The Kindle yeah. book uh, had me thinking, oh, it's only 100 pages, but then I spent hours and hours reading this one. <laughs> so. My memory is that it isn't quite as dense as either of the two books that we've just read, though, because of, oh, it was released in like serialized form uh, in a mm -hmm. magazine uh, uh, over a period of time. So it was very much about being uh, chunky writing and, you know, kind of get that bit of the story, you know, mm -hmm. read the next one kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. It is Cities in Flight, right? Am I yes, yeah. it is. Cities yeah, in okay. English. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Um, I have a theory that I want to test as we go along. I think that, well, I've read a couple of Philip K. Dick books that make me think this, but I feel like women are somewhat overly sexualized or like the sexual thoughts aspect of it is a little highish in the early sci-fi. Um, it almost feels like a requirement. So I want to see as we go along if any authors mm. do that differently or, um, yeah, because it felt in this book, again, like I understand what you all said, but it felt unnecessary, but realistic, I suppose, now that you pointed out, but um, or it could have been done differently to make the same point, I thought. So we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Really? I, Chris and Jared, I already apologize for my awkward, awkward questions going forward with these books <laughs> and women. <laughs> it, the the uh, early sci-fi um, was kind of a boys club back mm. then. It was hard for women to break into the field back then. There were some, but uh, so that that doesn't surprise me that early sci-fi has a lot mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. yeah, and I'm I'm kind of feeling a bit awkward because I, um, I I didn't see it as an issue. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it didn't bother me. I said I thought I I didn't say anything before because you know everyone was having an opinion. But um, yeah, I don't know what that makes me but uh, <laughs> it should be with the girls and i'm just like well it it seemed normal or it's I mean, it felt necessary for the character i mean it fit into his condition his uh, psychological mm -hmm. state yeah he was lonely he was drunk and he was horny it, yeah i i didn't see it as a, as a problem yeah. um so so the, the point is, don't worry about me. I I, I read anything. I'm, 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 I'm happy to read anything. There was. I wish I'd highlighted it now because there was. I swear there was a beginning of one of the chapters where the beginning sentence was unbelievably sexist, and I can't. I didn't highlight oh, it. And yes. I think I might. I might go away and then come back, put it in our group chat because I was blown away by that first sentence, and I was just like, what on earth? There um, was one. Yeah. And I was just like, I think. So I think it's. I did understand the concept of, you know, you're lonely and you're whatever, but I just felt if I'd been, even if I was in that situation for three years, I wouldn't be thinking that about, well, maybe that's just me, about about that. And I, was, I can't, I can't see men having such a different view mm. on sexuality and how they feel things and what they do when they get that. That's why I wanted to ask Jared and Chris their opinions, because I was like, is it so different if you're a guy? And it just seemed overly done. But everyone sees things differently that's the whole point about yeah. reading it together we, so. i mean we can't speak to all guys you know so you know? You know? <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> 
I think that's one of the topics I'm endlessly fascinated by. Is it's, I think I said this in one of the Friday night conversations. I think it was one. It was on with you. You was it? Probably it was the week before. Whichever one it was. The difference between a male gaze and a female gaze. I sort of know what a male gaze feels like. I never mm. experienced a female gaze, but actually hearing about that all the time and mm. through experiencing that through works of like literature or, or film or otherwise, and how the author either was male or female and how they would represent that dif that differently is like endlessly fascinating to me mm -hmm. yeah yeah no, no absolutely absolutely and to your point Susanna I think usually it doesn't bother me if I find an explanation for it in the work and I think in this case there was I refused to see it because <laughs> it bothered me so much <laughs> until we uh, talked to Chris and Jared about this but um yeah it bothers me when it feels pointless or there for the sake of it it felt like it was at least at least the way it was written about felt like it's there for the sake of it sure it agrees with the character and so on but it felt unnecessarily much um but yeah <laughs> that's just my opinion <laughs> cool um I guess we're ready to sign off then. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go around again. Susanna, would you like to tell us where to find you and your books? Uh, my books are available pretty much everywhere on Amazon. It's Timelessness. It's five books. And um, my channel is Den of the Weird. I'll have it. I probably should put it on my name next time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just Google Susanna Imaginario and you'll find everything, don't worry. My name is Chris Moore. You can find me on my YouTube channel, which is just my name. You can find me, well, I was going to say tomorrow, but we're recording it tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> uh, talking about uh, Wars and Light and Shadow with mm. some of the lovely people here. And I'll, as you'll find me on X at 7 o'clock channel. <laughs> Most, mostly just liking and retweeting posts, but yeah. <laughs> I can't say X. It just doesn't sound right at all. I X'd. I read on X. There was an X. I can't. It just doesn't flow. They're just asking for a lot of innuendo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, oh, I'm Jared. Uh, you can find me at The Fantasy Thinker on YouTube and um, on the page Chewing Forms as well. Uh, I'm Robin. Uh, Bookends and Biscuits is my YouTube channel, and I think it's just. Um, Bookends Biscuit, maybe, on X, uh, which is where I'm, I'm mostly on social media, but check page tune forms as well. Hi, and I'm, uh, you can find me at El Goshi on X or Balladie Magazine on X. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Varsha. My YouTube channel is Reading by the Rainy Mountain. Uh, we all hang out quite a bit on the Patreon forum where we make plans for these uh, reading groups. And also, I most recently have a podcast called Bright Threads in the Tapestry, if you'd like to check that out. It's available on a few different podcast platforms, which I also post as a playlist on my YouTube channel. So it's available both places. Um, yeah, that's everything for today. Uh, we'll see everyone in a month. If you'd like to join us on this reading group or for some or all of them, we are reading cities in flight yeah that's in frame mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> next month um we're reading the first half of it it's a bind up of four books like we said earlier it's uh we're going to be reading the first two books next month and then the next two the month after um if you'd like to join us either for just the reading group and join us on the forum discussion threads or to participate in the discussions here uh come check out the page chewing forum uh there are calendar events that you can sign up or rsvp for cool Thank you.